Hello and welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and with me is... Aaron. Christian's taking the night off. So, what are you drinking tonight, Aaron? I actually have a magical unicorn elixir from Obed Nizek's. <laughs> it is a very awesome IPA. It's very citrusy. Also has a bit of sweetness to it. Like I said before, I'm usually not a fan of IPAs, but I had this and it's just awesome. There's a lot of sweetness to it, a little hoppy. It's very smooth. It doesn't really it doesn't have a lot of bite to it, which is why I like it. Hmm. But love it. Nice. Tonight I'm drinking a Smash Galaxy Double IPA from Alaskan Brewery. I'm not I'm not so excited about this one. I was really excited because I I really like the bottle because it's purple and green and bottle art really does it for me usually. And like, how can you screw up a double IPA? But like, there's just something about this one. I'm just not not super into. Sorry, Alaskan. (laughs) But I'm going to drink it anyway because it's, you know, it's here and it's relatively tasty. So tonight we've got a whole bunch of news topics for you guys. We are in the Murph month. So this month is going to be heavy on 3D printing because uh, it's heavy on our minds. So a lot of our news topics are 3D printing related. We're just kind of going to go from there and freeform it tonight. So our first uh, news topic is Nick Seward, who if you've never heard of him, he is uh, kind of famous in the RepRap world for making some very strange 3D printers. I think you mean awesome printers. I love all of his designs. Yes. He is a uh, teacher, and he teaches mechanical design and uh, robotic kinematics to his students, and he does it through having them build uh, these very strange kinematic models into 3D printers. Uh, Over the years, he's built a Core XZ 3D printer that was all laser cut and driven with... uh, fishing line and tightened with guitar tuners uh that printer was super cool he's built the rep rap uh lisa and the simpson which is the uh it's three printed arms also with the so with the fishing line it's it's um build area and the way it was constructed is that it can print 30 percent larger models of itself yes and i thought that was <laughs> awesome yeah and it's like a uh a tripod with uh gears uh used herringbone gears and like is very um robot walker esque in how it, it looked it's very neat um but anyway uh his latest uh printers have been the RepRap Helios and um that printer is a scara arm type design so if you've ever seen those or if you've never seen those they are an arm that has a shoulder and then all of its other joints kind of swing out in a parallel plane and the entire arm moves up and down or it has an axis on the very end that moves up and down for its z-axis fashion and last year he debuted one that traveled along carbon fiber tubes and he was talking about making it into a canoe printer and he was pretty excited about that. But just recently, he debuted a rolling Helios prototype where he took the Scara arm and set it on a cart that has an angle, and it just drives down the, uh, like, a desk or um, a floor, anything that's a build volume, essentially, and is able to build in an infinite uh, X direction or a Y direction. Um, and it, it's, it's a really, really neat concept. So we, we say infinite, but we're getting into territory now where we've got printers like the printer belt where that's a truly infinite plane, whereas something like this, <laughs> you're limited by the table or the floor size of the room. The length of your power cables. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of the printer belts and this thing, all of these printer heads are at an angle and i don't i still don't understand why the angle matters like why why wouldn't a normal flat 
having the printer head parallel to the bed, why would that still not work in this situation? Okay, so uh, there's a very good reason for that. Um, with it, really any of them, um, if your, we'll say your belt is your x-axis, if your part is longer than the printer itself in the x-axis, and your printer head was vertical, every x move, like say you were printing your perimeters, it would have to travel off of the belt and then come back onto the belt. So your part would end up protruding past the limits of the printer, even though it's an infinite build platform, and then it would have to come back. Versus uh, most of these, they're printing between a 30 and a 37 degree angle. So it's at, you know, an end plate. So when you start, your first layer is a single line. And then it shifts. And then your next layer is, uh, for those of you that can't see, I'm drawing this on my hand and my webcam so Aaron can see. Your next layer is a line. And then it moves up and it builds a line between those two. And then it comes down and then it builds another line behind the last one. And the next layer, it moves forward a little more. And then there's three lines. And it, it keeps building on top of that. And then eventually, uh, you see, like, in the uh, Helios printer video we're going to link, you know, you end up with this, like, big for every layer. Instead of having to do this really long travel and then move over and then come back and really, really long travel. And at all that time, your print has time to detach and it probably moves off the heated build area. It, there's an added benefit to it all, though is these non-planar lines end up creating uh, some strength benefits depending on the design of your part. So there's there's been some research over the years into uh, non-planar slicing engines. Um, one of them was called Bread, which I thought was hilarious. It was a really good pun. But they he was able to build layers that were triangular. So they would be like, you know, your first layer would be a line, and oh. then your next layer would be a triangle on top of that line with two layers and then triangle on top of that line. And that created uh, some really, really interesting uh, strength properties for these additive parts that aren't achievable with your normal building up on single layers thing. Interesting. So, yeah, it's really interesting. And the problem is it's a really hard slicing problem to solve when you're doing non planar layers. But the... Uh, the belt printers, essentially, you can use any slicer, do your slicing normally. And uh, there's been a couple of people uh, like Bill Steele and uh, Black Belt has a version uh, of a post processor that will take your code and you're like, I, my gantry is at a 37 degree angle and it will transform all of your G code values to work with that printer. Nice. Yeah, it's it's really neat. It's a it really simplifies a problem that really uh, concerned me when I started researching belt printers. Is like, how am I going to deal with this? Because I am not a software guy. So uh, when I found that, it was pretty cool. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so the next one, um, a, a really awesome maker called Ariel Yanni did a really good build video on. Um, safer version of Luna anodizing. Do you want to take that one? Yeah. Yeah. So normally with anodization, you have to use uh, what sulfuric acid to, yeah. you know, yeah. take away Battery the top acid. layer. Yeah. There is a, there's a hack of the article from like 2011 that goes, it goes into a brief introduction of the safer method. But um, this guy just created a new YouTube video, which uses this new um, slightly safer method. It still uses lye like you would use for soap making, but it's still generally safer than sulfuric acid. And it's also a lot easier to dispose of afterwards because um, yeah. you just got to, you know, normalize it. But the overall process is you would use a lye to strip the um, top surface of the aluminum. Then you'd throw it into a um, electrolytic tank, kind of like um, you'd use for electrolysis to take rust and stuff off of old parts. But that has some sort of sodium bicarbonate or something in it 
but then that will help take out more of that aluminum to make it more porous and accept dye. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can then put it into something else to add the dye to it. But overall, the process is a lot safer. It's a lot um, easier to do. You can pick up pretty much most of the materials from home, from a, a hardware store. Um, a lot of these things he used, like you know, drain cleaner and all those other things. So it's more it's more of using off the shelf products. Could easily also just order order pure stuff. Yeah, he had um, CNC cut out an aluminum dog tag for his his dog, and he explained this whole process doing that. But apparently, the electrolytic process actually gets a lot thicker. Um, anodization layer than using just the sulfuric acid. Or, really? Uh, that's I'm, what this is saying. I'm really curious to try it out because uh, I remember about a year ago I went over to Josh's house when he was doing all of the clear anodization on mm -hmm. his trailer hitch tags and I saw his acid bath and everything and it's like, that is terrifying. You have kids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I... I, I'm excited about this process, and I'm I'm glad that Ariel is still making videos. That guy is, is really really cool. He was absolutely instrumental in the early laser web days. So oh nice, yeah, I didn't know that. So in other really really cool 3D printing and Murph related news, uh, earlier this week the Open RC Project guys uh, started a GoFundMe to bring Daniel Norier to uh, Murph 2019. Uh, he had announced a couple months ago that he wasn't going to be able to make it this year, and everyone was really sad because um, he's put a lot into the RepRap world, and the Open RC F1 race last year was a huge hit. It was hilarious, and um, the cars are just really, really neat, and he's getting ready to release a new design in a couple weeks. So, anyway... They started the GoFundMe, um, and they absolutely smashed the goal in like four hours. So um, that was really, really inspiring to see um, everyone from the RepRap community come together and, and bring somebody who's pretty great over to the States and uh, yeah, make sure they're part of the event that they helped create. So. Yeah, it's always exciting seeing the members of a community come together like this. Yeah. It's always exciting. Um, the GoFundMe is still active, it looks like. Yeah, uh, they are essentially, he needed $1,500 to get over here. And any money that's donated to the campaign after that will be used to further the OpenRC project. Yeah, between the Truggy and the F1 designs is a really, really cool project. So I, I'm excited to see where that's going to go in the future. Yeah. And in other silly 3D printing related news, the somebody actually went out to the source and asked, how do we say slick 3R or sli <laughs> slice 3R or slicer? And uh, Alessandra, I'm, no, I'm not even going to try. The author of slicer says, I've always said it, Slicer. So, so it didn't really help with the GIF and GIF thing because the creator you know, said it, one thing and everyone's like, eh, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> yeah, what do you know? You only <laughs> created the file format, you only wrote the software. But, like, at the same time, though, uh, Thomas earlier this week, or Tom, he came out with a video explaining why he says slick 3r and i get it it made sense like, he's constantly talking about different slicers like at least four on his channel so how do you differentiate without putting like silly little odd like uh. you know, view cues in or saying like i'm going to use slicer as my slicer it's it's goofy but it's still goofy to say slick 3r so, I don't know. Dude, this unicorn know. elixir is amazing. <laughs> I love it. I'm hoping that I'm going to like the Smash Galaxy more as I drink it. It's like 9%, so I probably will. It gets better the more I drink it. It's amazing. <laughs> Moving on. All right, so we've got two more news articles. Uh, do you want to take the uh, heat set inserts? Yeah. Cool. So... I have input. But. Yeah. 
So uh, Nakaday um, wrote a really great um, how-to on heat set inserts for your 3D prints. It's very long, actually, but with a lot of great info. Um, there, there's yeah. even really nicely detailed uh, diagrams on showing, you know, the insert game put in. They've got a lot of tips and tricks on it. For instance, they'll show you... Hang on. For those of you that don't know what a heat set insert is, it's a little chunk of brass that's got some teeth on the sides of it, and you make a hole in your 3D print that is appropriately sized, and then you can use a soldering iron to put it in, and you get nice, strong, reliable threads to put bolts into your 3D printed parts. Yeah. Carry on. It's kind of like in, it's kind of like melting a nut inside your print, but it's yes. a specially designed nut for threads. It's far more effective. Yeah, we used to do that back in the day. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there are these really nice diagrams which will show you, you know, how how wide do you make your uh, hole to fit the inserts? Like, how much tolerance do you give it to, to let the plastic melt? They talk about using the actual heat set insert tips for soldering irons. Mm -hmm. And why you shouldn't use just your normal soldering iron tip. And, and I can confirm yeah. that the, the problems they mentioned do happen, but they haven't happened enough for me to go out and buy heat set insert tips. And I put a lot of inserts in. So Yeah, so we we have an iron at the space dedicated to heat set inserts, and it's just got the standard tip on it still. Yeah, but the they linked to um, some maker-made heat set insert tips on Tendi. And I kind of want to buy them purely because I'm supporting someone else's passion project. And I've been doing that a lot lately is like doing that whole voting with my dollar thing. But it, like buying quality made tools from other makers. Yeah. That's nice. awesome. I just bought a sweet screwdriver from Tactical T Keychains. You're my boy, Brad. The guy's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Carrying on, though. This article is pretty great. It's funny, too, because I've been doing a lot of the things they mention in this, like using the uh, a flat reference surface to cool for a long time. And I've never thought of it as something novel that somebody else wouldn't do. So I'm glad they put this into an article that other people can enjoy. But I really want to know how they got these beautiful reference diagrams. Like, What did they use? Yeah, I don't know, man. They're gorgeous. Also, we'll link to um, some studies that I did when I was at Lulzbot where we uh, put together some best practices for the company to follow for using heat set inserts. Um, and we made a, a jig to test the pull out strength and the torque out strength of different inserts. And uh, we have some different guidelines for uh, placing heat sets into different types of plastics for different thread sizes. So when you buy them, they give you a recommended drill size for an injection molded plastic, and it's completely different for 3D printed plastic. So it's it's good to test. Yeah, I haven't done much, and by much, I haven't done any heat set inserts. <laughs> so reading the, well, reading this article, the, the things like using the flat reference plane was like, that makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't yeah. have thought of that if I was just doing it. Well, what made me start doing it is they're really hard to put in straight. And I, a lot of the parts I was building, um, it became a problem because my, my bolt would just be a tiny bit cockeyed. And then I couldn't assemble my parts anymore. And I'm like, oh, no. How do I make sure that these are always flat? And the easiest thing was I use a, uh, um, a one, two, three block from a mill, which is like, flat, plain, cold steel. And I put it in most of the way, and then I press it into the one, two, three block, and that gives me a nice flush surface, and it doesn't give me the bulging out. So Nice. And that was one of the main things that they mentioned in the article and yeah. I was kind of excited about. And then the last thing. E3D released the Super Volcano. Didn't you make one of those? Finally, I did. I did make a super volcano, and it's not near as pretty as these. If you were at Murph last year, you would have seen it. And uh, it made a couple prints. It actually worked really good. It used a custom machined nozzle and a standard heat break from a V6. And I machined the heater block 
So it had two 40 watt heater cartridges. So it had 80 watts of heater power and a two millimeter nozzle uh, with a uh, 60 millimeter melt zone. <laughs> In comparison, a standard V6 has about a nine millimeter melt zone. So <laughs> six times the melt is not six times the fast. Um, <laughs> actually, it, it is, uh, but you run into two uh, factors. Um, and I, re I have run into this with the Super Volcano as well. After Murph last year, they sent me one um, for testing. And I've been working with uh, the main engineer that's, that worked on that for most of the year dealing with different problems. And the main problems that we've come across are the biggest one is cooling. So now you've pumped all of this heat into your plastic and plastic has a property called heat latency, which is like how long it takes to remove the latent heat from the plastic and cool it. And PLA, which is one of the easiest plastics to print in a large part, has the biggest heat latency of most of the plastics that we 3D print. So it's uh, the hardest to cool. And hmm. uh, what Sam and I ran into was it's really hard to pump enough air into the area to cool the part fast enough to not curl or to not droop. Um, but you were totally able to get these insane layer adhesions. Um, like the big rocket that we printed on the Mazu two years ago. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times that thing's been dropped. And uh, <laughs> it's only one layer thick and it's never broken. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the uh, the super volcano is not for the faint of heart. It's got eighty watts of heater cartridge. They give you a copper heater block for a reason. Um, <laughs> I've melted an aluminum block with a thirty, so it's a it's pretty it's a pretty big deal. But um, currently, the super volcano that I have is has a point six nozzle on it. And I can print as fast as my 3D printer can move. So I, I run uh, layers at 150 millimeters a second. And really, the main thing I ran into at that point was I couldn't get the extruder to turn fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, Holy cow. Yeah, it has a 0.9 degree uh, stepper motor on it. And I was dropping steps. So um, I need to... I need to change some things up on that that side so I can extrude fast enough. Which yeah. is just silly. Would going to a, <laughs> would going to a one point eight like double that? Yeah, going to a one point eight would help. Uh, going to a slightly stronger motor would help. It's a, I think it's a fifty ounce inch motor. So going to like uh, a seventy or a ninety ounce inch motor would help. Um, there's a few things I could do. Uh, to get that the, the RPMs to stop wrapping out, I mean, it screams. Like, I've never seen an extruder gear move that fast. You can't see the teeth. Goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I want to get into is uh, getting a printer, you know, good enough to do all these crazy things with. Yeah, just to play with it and try it out. A lot of the gear portions from the gear tower we made for uh, MakerFest were yeah. printed on the Super Volcano. Hmm. And like it was like my Taz could print it in 12 hours and the Super Volcano could print it in four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, and that's maxing out a 200 by 300 by it ended up being like 200 and 12 millimeter build volume on Gosh. my i4 after the length from the super volcano so yeah when i maxed out my build area on the mark ii the prusa mark ii for that it still took like 28 hours yeah yeah and that's at the fast profile so that wraps up our news topics for the night you know there's still a lot of things going on in the next month for 3d printing right so you had some ideas of things you wanted to talk about tonight, Aaron. Did I? Well, okay. So one there of the a lot things, of things thrown out before the show. To one talk of the about. things that we threw this, th we did bad planning this week. One of the things that we threw out was covering, uh, sticking with long-term projects. Ah, yes. And, and this one's, uh, 
is big for me um, for two reasons. Uh, one last week we did the the twentieth episode of just us talking, which is the longest time I've ever stuck with content creation. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I'm always like, yeah, I, I'm making these things and I never finish them. And every week we finish something, which is great. Um, but you know, just this week I've uh come super close to wrapping up two of the longest term projects I've had. So last week I did most of the finishing touches on the baby mill and this week I closed up the back panel and uh so I'm no longer running wires out the electronics panel anymore to get it to work like it's basically a machine tool now the nice. last thing I need to do is uh, add a monitor mount to it and then tonight five minutes before we started recording this I was buttoning up the electronics panel on my automated chameleon cage which has been something I've been working on for a year and a half. Yeah. So like that will be a chameleon cage tonight or tomorrow morning. Awesome. Which is super exciting. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. I'm really working hard on like finishing things. <laughs> yeah. About that. <laughs> we have so many things. <laughs> Yeah, so I feel like I'm always talking about this, but my goal for this year is to finish that access control system for the makerspace. It's been challenging to focus on it. Uh, I've already been called out once or twice this week on it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to do other things. And they're like, yeah, but how's that access control thing going? And I'm like, shut up. Anyways. Well, I get it. It's not sexy. Like it's, it's Not anymore. I've been thinking about it for like a year and a half. Like, all the problems are solved in my head. And it's like... They're not solved, though. They're not. They're solved in your head. Yeah. Like, that's not solved. Because that's... as soon as you start implementing them, there's going to be new problems involved with them that are going to make them unsolved. I mean, you're they're, right. They're unsolved the... mysteries. <laughs> do, do, I don't know. <sighs> I don't remember the name. How do I miss that song? I grew up with that song, like, every night in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually had some free time today and I managed to get pretty much the entire wire diagram done for it. Uh, I had it pretty much done last year before our daughter was born, but that was based on the ESP8266. And since then, I wanted to migrate it to the ESP32 um, mm. for more more program space, um, adds a Bluetooth radio, a lot of other neat stuff to it. And I never got I never got back around to changing out the wiring for it. So today I actually got it pretty much all done. I got everything set up on the on my breadboard. I've got a giant piece of proto board that I'm gonna move it move to it probably on Monday or Tuesday. I needed I forgot to order some level shifters because it's a DSP thirty two is a three point three volt logic. Mm -hmm. And I have a single NeoPixel, or like the generic, you know, WS2812B yeah. like LED. Um, that is a 5-volt logic device, so I need a level shifter, and I don't have one. So I have one of those coming in. Once I get that in, then I'm going to get everything on the proto board. Have an, and that'll be the farthest I've ever gotten. Um, when I did it before, it was only ever on breadboard. That might be the farthest anyone's ever gotten on an access control system <laughs> based on the people I've talked to. <laughs> yeah, so I'm ex I'm excited. Um, the biggest thing for me is getting it onto that proto board where it'll just be actually like solid and not like yeah. shaky. Because then I can actually wires work on it. out. <laughs> I should have my old firmware somewhere on one of these computers or thumb drives. I have to go find it. I'm not opposed to rewriting it. Because, you know, whenever whenever I look at past Aaron's code, that guy's always a moron. So <laughs> I, I'd almost yeah. rather just rewrite it. But I'll, 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 I'll try and find it, see if I can't improve it. But I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful now. So I, I've reprogrammed a lot of past Joe's programs. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You're always better. Like the second time it comes around, you're always better. Yeah. Um, like just this week, I've redone the configuration and the wiring for the chameleon cage like four different times. 
And uh, this <laughs> last time, it was a super easy project. I did it in like 15 minutes. Because <laughs> I'm just getting better at it every time. Uh, yeah, it's weird how that works. Yeah. My, my biggest problem this week was I couldn't get the temperature sensors to read. And they're a, a one-wire um, library from, like, so, like, all of the sensors have a sense pin on one wire. Yeah. And they use the one-wire libraries. And uh, I like, no matter what I did, I couldn't get them to show up. And uh, there's, like, a, a W1 Therm sensor library that you can download on the Pi to, like, test everything. They weren't showing up there, but they were showing up on my desk before I moved them into the electronics enclosure. <laughs> I was like, what is the problem? Well, I was trying to be clever and uh, connectorize everything. And I was like, you know what moves logic really well is Ethernet wire. You, you know what isn't super reliable for pen for pen is Ethernet wire when you pen them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, doesn't it lose its reliability once it starts to unravel? Even like the slightest bit, you start getting that interfe interference. Well, I mean, I'm not. There's two wires that have to transfer logic over, and the rest of them were just voltage and ground. So I was basically just using a Cat6 wire as a bundle of wires. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sending information over all of those wires. There's only one or two wires that get, are getting information or carrying information in the Cat6. For how I was using it. Yeah. I don't know. It's all complicated mumbo jumbo. Let's just say that I was wrong. Okay. And that was the reason I spent a week troubleshooting this project instead of just moving forward with it. I can accept that. I tried to be clever and it never try like, to be clever, Joe. Th that always gets you in the end. <laughs> it always gets you. Whenever I see engineer like software engineers trying to be clever, I'm like, please don't. <laughs> it's only going to cause everybody, you know, a headache down the road. Yeah. The best solutions are the dead simple ones. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up just like cutting all of that out and taking the, the really nice Cat6 um, gland connectors I had bought and everything. Took all that out and just wired it all into an eight conductor bundle and wired it directly into the Pi like I should have from the beginning. And guess what? It all works great. <laughs> it works great I've got temperature sensors and humidity sensors and I can turn the misting on based on the humidity it's so cool nice yeah there's going to be a whole thing on it but it's ridiculous Like, take anything away from this episode folks just don't try to be clever just do it right <laughs> yes simple is always better yeah keep it simple stupid yeah I've been I've been debating on how to approach that for the access control system after the sensor part's done, because um, I've already narrowed down the the scope for the sensor itself to just the uh, RFID scanner, the NeoPixel for status, um, a push button to disable the machine. So if it's broken or something's weird with it, anybody can hit the oh. button and it will disable the machine. And the solid state relay to actually control the power to the thing. Okay. Um, before I also had a current sensor because I thought I thought it'd be really neat, and I think it still would be to be able to dynamically detect the power profile of the machine, mm -hmm. so that the idea was they would just badge in, and then it would kind of unlock the machine to be used, and unless it senses the power being used, it would then shut off after a certain amount of time. Okay. Um, also, once they turn it on, use it, then turn it off, it'll detect it being turned off, and then disconnect the relay. So essentially, they only have to badge once. Okay. Um, it, it would, you know, it would serve the purpose of reducing a badge scan from two to one. And also, you could, if you wanted to, you could gather like power usage data. Mm -hmm. But it was just another, you know, piece of complexity. Yeah, I wasn't sure how I was going to handle because I want this thing to be as universal as possible. So I wasn't sure how I was going to handle all machines, especially something like 3D printers, yeah. where there's so many things that goes on with that. That seems like a 
a really quick way to have somebody's print shut off halfway through. <laughs> I know. So my solution for that right now, for one thing, is just to get rid of the current sensor. But I think this will work for everything but 3D printers. Um, my plan for those is down the road, once I actually finish this, is write an Octoprint plugin, which will take an IP address to my little gateway for all the sensors. And then it will plug into the Octoprint Pi, like the it'll have a little scanner, an RFID badge scanner. And so, so all you do is you if you before you start a print, it'd be like you know scan your badge. Then it will query the same API that all the other sensors do, and it'll that way it'll follow the same process. And then you won't need, I won't need to bother with the pro, the power profile of the printer. Okay, so that's kind of how I I've solved that for now. All right. Yeah, it seems like a. Uh, Gen 1.1 1. 1 or yeah, 1. that's 5 that's like my feature. lowest lowest priority. <laughs> yeah, because like every other tool, I'm every other tool pretty much you have to be at to operate. You have to be present. Yeah, that's kind of like the big one that sticks out that you you are pretty much never present. The challenge is how well, do you I mean, handle that. You're present for the beginning and right most of the first layer. If you're a responsible 3D printer, or if you're not, you start it from a webcam while you're at work and your printer's at home, and then your house is on fire. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If I could figure out how to, you know, monitor the power profile and determine when the print's done, you know, like the extruder turns off, the, the heater and the bed turn off, I should be able to sense that. Um, then I could just shut, I could then, that's when the relay could then turn off. But if I don't yeah. have that, you have no idea when the printer is done. The goal of this was to be able to charge users for time used for the machine. Oh, but if I, okay. if I can never... So with all the other tools, without the current sensor, they have to badge in to start, and they badge it to stop the timer. Yeah. But with printers, they're not present for the end of the print normally. I think there's some um, Octoprint plugins out there that do that already. Might be worth looking into that yeah. for the space. I, I did learn with that better heater timeout that we're using at the space. Yeah. If you start the print with any method that's not Octoprint, the timeout plugin's like, hey, I didn't start that. I'm shutting you off in 600 seconds. I don't care what you're doing. Man, I chased that <laughs> with the tool changer. It basically, since like I started the tool changer because so I, I set up Octoprint on it. I put better heater timeout or no better heater timeout was already on it because I just robbed the pie off of my Taz and because I wanted to watch web webcams of yeah. it running. I've had the duet guys chasing this bed timed out <laughs> heater error. I've had uh, you know, other other people in the tool changer beta watching for it because you know we're all sharing firmware. Nobody could find it. And then one day, um, my hot end timed out too. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is that? And uh, so I started going through the whole system. And it, it's that stupid plugin. That plugin is great as long as you start your print through Octoprint. But I've been using the Duet web interface because it's phenomenal. It, the only thing it's missing is the time lapse from Octoprint. And remote interfacing, but you know that's it's not that that's kind of why I don't to. like things like Octoprint. It's like it's, just, it's another layer of complexity that you have to take into account when you yeah. troubleshoot things. Well, and you know the plugins they're not super vetted, so they might be buggy. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's one that I'm using right now for um, a filament runout sensor, and it's buggy. And uh, <laughs> It, it's one of those open source projects that has the assumption that you know what you're doing for a lot of things that aren't just that project is the way they troubleshoot it. It's um, in the readme. He's like, for troubleshooting, use a git method and include this. And I'm like, what's a git method? How do I do that? I have no idea what all this is. And finally, um, I asked, uh, I asked Ryan and uh, so I was like, you know, web things, you know how to do this stuff. How do I check this? And he's like, oh, uh, use use curl and, and type this in. I would have never figured that out. 
but it totally it totally worked and i was able to troubleshoot my issue <laughs> what the hell's a get method I, exactly if you google it you're not gonna find it nothing yeah like, i'm not the type of person to ask somebody first like i use get every day i never and, heard of that well no not not get get the g-e-t the capital get. g-e-t it's a get method like oh I, it, it's like a web thing i'm not a web guy i'm a 3d printer dude i don't know those things <laughs> You think get a Linux thing? I don't or a know. Curl thing? It, it, the the thing that Ryan gave me was a curl uh, command, and it worked great. But man, it took me a while. Oh, that was the other thing we were going to talk about: open source projects that assume. That's like a whole nother episode. We really need to keep better track of our our potential topics. Yeah, that's a whole nother episode. Every week we involve, seem to struggle on what we're going to talk about. Involve 3D printing. Well, you know, we have a really great audience now. So if you guys want to talk about things, in fact, with this month being 3D printing month, if you guys have 3D printing related topics, if you have problems that you want to solve, um, have like weird filament that you can't get to stick to your bed or you can't solve this one method with like your big giant 3d printer nozzles or something like that let us know uh we're pretty decent at that stuff and we also know a lot of people that are pretty decent um next week we're gonna have uh john from uh midwest rep rap fest on yeah. to talk about the history of murph how it came about and uh things that we might see at 2019 super excited to have john on um do you have anything else aaron uh yeah i'd have to say uh stay tuned for uh really interesting and exciting murph uh announcements from us <sighs> as we as we struggle through this month of getting ready for murph <laughs> yeah there's there's so much and there's so much i'm so excited about it's gonna be a great great year for murph it's gonna be a great year so all right guys yeah, with all of that, hit us up on social media. Uh, if there's anything, we've been way more active on Twitter lately, uh, oh, which yeah. has been really fun. Aaron and I are both manning the Makers on Tap Twitter account and having great fun heckling the world. I, I love when we have discussions back and forth on the same Twitter account. <laughs> it's great. That's what Twitter's for, right? I don't know how to do the Twitters. <laughs> I am I am I'm not good at them. I don't care. I'm having fun. Um, all right, guys, with that, uh, this is Joe, and I'm, I'm out. Keep this is Aaron, stuff. and this is also the end of the podcast. <laughs>